Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And now, as you ever to the papers, and I can't remember a death which has divided the press and divided the commentators quite like that of Fidel Castro's. There's the Sunday Telegraph. They don't have their main picture, Fidel Castro himself, but American uh, Cuban exiles celebrating his death there, and a story about Theresa May and business pay crackdown. In stark contrast, the Sunday Times, Fidel Castro, their scourge of the West, they say, dies at 90. World divides over revolutionary icon who became a murderous tyrant, and I think I suspect we'll be dividing ourselves across the sofa on that subject in a moment. But also a very interesting story here. They've got an interview with Theresa May, who says that the Brexit challenge is keeping her awake at night. I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, but there you go. And then there's the Observer. Um, uh, Fidel Castro, a very straightforward picture there, with his, uh, with his beard staring into the distance. And another very interesting story there, saying that uh, care for the elderly, the system in this country, is now close to collapse and talking about the need for much more money to save the NHS as well, because of all the beds that are being used by elderly people. We'll talk about that later in the programme. On a very different note, the Mail on Sunday there, uh, Ted Heath's accuser of those sex attacks is a satanic sex fantasist, the police were told, apparently, by their expert advisor, but they're carrying on with the probe nonetheless. And finally, the Sunday Express, there's a story there saying, Nigel Farage now fears for his life after the Brexit vote and the Trump vote and can't go out without police protection. So a great deal to talk about all. Paul, take us away. You've chosen the sun with uh, the Castro coverage. Oh, man in heaven. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, Castro is divisive, but the moment I realised he died and you know, woke up yesterday morning, I, my mind went to the people of Cuba, who I think are slightly missing, in fact, very missing, from all the press coverage today. You know, they have suffered so much for the act of rebellion that they, they carried out in 1959, throwing out a US-backed dictator. Uh, last time I was there, a guy took me to the heart of the forest, my guide. He was a critic of Castro. He said, look, do you think, don't think we like this, this the, the suppression of freedom, the suppression of free yes. speech. But look, there are the slave pens that the Spanish had, and, that they, and this is, these are the kind of slave-driving techniques that the Americans you know, imposed on us. Do not think, because we dislike you know, the, the autocracy and the suppression of freedom, that we will ever ac accept mm. the rule of America back into so our in country. So in a sense, your view is the, the Cubans were caught between a rock, the Americans and the hard place, Castro. And the hard place, the USSR. You know, he makes the revolution in 59. He says it's not a communist revolution. And I think he was genuine at that time. He was a left nationalist. You know, the ideology of Cuban liberation is about left nationalism. Uh, but he's pushed into the arms of the Soviet Union and he begins to act like a classic East European Soviet, you know, tyrant, call it what you will. Uh, but, but the Cuban people, I mean, this is the tragedy they left in the 20th century, were still able to, to achieve economically so much and politically in Africa to defeat, to help defeat apartheid. This is one of Castro's legacies, but let's not, so let's when, not say so it's when, Castro's when, legacy. When, it is the Cuban people's legacy. When, when Jeremy Corbyn says we must remember him as a great uh, fighter for social justice... Then Jeremy Corbyn speaks for me. Very good. All right, Miranda. The other, the, another side of him, of course, is the beard, the cigar, yes. the image, the kind of iconic Castro thing. And there's some second-rate writer who's been burbling on in the Sunday Times on that, that subject. That's right. There's some man called Andrew Marr. I don't know who he is, but anyway, he makes yeah. a few good points, um, which is really, I think, also it's interesting because the great age of the Cuban Revolution was also the great age of photography and photographic reportage, and of course, this young Cuban photographer Corda. Who, exactly. who creates the iconic images of, of uh, Che Guevara and then Castro, and they go on to T-shirts and badges and stuff all around the world. Quite so, and bought by us all in Streatham High Street in the 80s. So, um, essentially, um, as you've seen in the Sunday Times today, you know, these wonderful black and white photographs from the 50s and 60s tell the story of a whole era, and it's the glamour of the revolutionaries. And, you know, Paul's alluded to the terrible human rights violations of the Cuban Revolution and of the Castro era, which are incredibly serious and are hor horrendously glossed over by the left, I think, today in their kind of celebrations of Castro's life. But you can see why it was so appealing, because, you know, the word icon is usually banned in journalism for the very good reason that it's horribly overused. But they created icons. They created Castro and Che Guevara alongside him as these 
exciting figures liberating a nation. And, mm. you know, now we have the age of government by television. Uh, we've, you know, we've got Trump as a new sort of political leader, sort of reality TV leader. But this was the great age of photography, and it was extremely easy if you had the right charisma to build a nation around mm. you and build that sort of loyalty. But, of course, repression was terrible under Castro. It was ferocious, absolutely. So uh, Paul says that Jeremy Corbyn speaks for him when he says that Castro was a champion of social justice. Does he speak for you as well, Fraser Nelson? No, he was a dictator who imprisoned and killed a whole bunch of people. And the thing is, you didn't, while we, people in the West were being taken away by the icon of Castro, people in Cuba were, um, were suffering from it. And here, I think somebody telegraphs a picture here of these Cubans in, um, in America who are, are celebrating. They've got the freedom to do that in the States. It would be a brave Cuban who would react that way. And you have to ask why did tens of thousands of Cubans make that 90 mile journey over the sea to America if Cuba was such a great place? They will tell you here what they were fleeing, yes. the oppression, the persecution of the families. And that's why it's very dangerous for any leader, not so much Jeremy Corbyn, because people don't really expect him to, to be sensible in such situations, but other world leaders. It, normally you would say, what a shame, God rest his soul. But because this was a dictator, people do have to caveat that. Now, the New York Times has got a quite good story about Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, who didn't make that caveat. He was saying that, um, that Castro was a revolutionary, um, a wonderful man and an orator. And it really, um, because he didn't put the caveat, he's got a lot of criticism. So the New York Times here is um, he's, they're quoting Ted Cruz, um, who's the... Um, uh, he, well, you know, but Paul laughs here, but he's a Cuban-American who's probably got some thoughts on this, yeah. accusing him of slobbering um, adultation. So this is, I mean, it's very difficult to, of course, in human instinct, thinks he's, di he's died. I remember when George Bush was told of the death of Yasser Arafat, he said, God, God rest his soul. And that's normally what you think. When a dictator dies, who's done so much atrocities, you have to factor that in. Of course, when, when a dictator died in Saudi Arabia, we ran the flag of um, Buckingham Palace at half mast last the year. The king, yeah. So you know, what it, about the comparison with Pinochet, when uh, again the right was yeah. saying, no, I think yes, see, he did some bad things, but he brought in free market economics. Pinochet I mean, had people raped by dogs, and the key economists of the West, Hayek, uh, you know, and, and, mm. and Milton Friedman, ran to congratulate him while this was going on. The left, certainly my part of the left, have never ceased to criticise the human rights violation. That, that Castro imposed on, on, in, in on, on Cuba. Gay people had a horrible time in Cuba. They did. Uh, <laughs> Re-education camps for homosexuals. Yeah, they, I mean, yeah, this they, is they, serious. Castro himself yeah. would sign the order. There yeah, was they, no they, sense of justice. Summary they, they, executions yes. for political yeah, opponents, well, yes. banning yes. trade unions. Well, so it's yes. the quality um, of the but and the however well, that no, we it have has to, to be because it has to be because we're talking here about the 20th century. We're talking here. The enemy he was facing killed a million civilians in 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 Vietnam. Castro didn't do that. Mm. Pinochet, you know, imposed a dictatorship in order to suppress the economic rights of his people. Castro raised them. Now, I don't think that excuses Castro's anti-democratic, tyrannical behavior, but one thing that he did also do is spread the revolution. He spread it, you know, to Africa, and in 1988, the South African Defense Force ran into the Cuban army and lost. That speeded the fall of apartheid. And surely we and, all and have Mandela to celebrate that. Mandela was a that. huge supporter of his as Mandela, a result. Mandela, Malcolm X, etc. I pride myself in smooth transitions from one story <laughs> to another. I don't have a smooth transition, really, except that we were talking about economists, and we're now going to talk about another economist, as it were. I think the biggest political story, probably, this, t this morning, is uh, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, who has a plan for Brexit, even if nobody else does, and he wants a, a transition which could go on for four years. So the background to this story today is, of course, we had the autumn statement uh, last week, uh, which had some rather gloomy figures on the state of the public finances. But we've also had some quite good news in terms of kind of business investment this year, so uh, this week. So this story is Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, who's been under serious fire from the Brexit side of the argument, from the pro-leave side of the argument. He apparently has a plan for what's being called a Brexit buffer. So this is the idea that Theresa May alluded to as well this week, that you have some sort of transition arrangement to, to, to prevent the British economy falling off a cliff edge 
when Brexit, Brexit happens at the end of the Article 50 process. So it's a very interesting story because really but where the news is, is going to go is how do we get ourselves out of this and what is the plan? And since there's a sort of deafening silence mm. from Number 10 about what the plan might be, mm. you know, nature abhors a vacuum and so does it news. And here comes Mark <laughs> Carney with apparently some sort of plan. And the Sun Sunday Times magazine has interviewed mm. Theresa May and it's an interesting interview, but I think it's fair to say that they haven't got a detailed account of exactly what's going to happen when Brexit occurs. Well, they haven't, but nobody has, because nobody yeah. knows. You know, Britain's going to go into these negotiations wanting pretty much all the good bits of the EU, but none of the bad bits. Uh, the worst case scenario is the WTO rules. It will be somewhere in between. Yeah. But we don't know what we're going to be given by the rest of the EU. Nobody debating it in Parliament could find out. And that's why we've got this incredibly unsatisfactory situation where everybody wants to know what's going to come and we won't know until these two years of negotiations are done. Now, Theresa May has said in the interview that this is what keeps her awake at night. Um, of course, this is the concern about her government, that Brexit is eclipsing everything else. Mm -hmm. She should be kept awake by, you know, um, like the social, NHS. a whole no. bunch of other things. But it seems that right now the only story we really hear is Brexit and nothing seems to be happening. Um, and interestingly, yes. Mark Carney has just won this power struggle with Theresa mm. May. Um, she had to compromise with him. He's in a pretty strong mm. position. Mm. So he's using this position to say, I'm going to start yeah. freelancing to negotiate myself. Yeah. So an unelected bureaucrat is now running our policy on Brexit. I mean, that is the problem of having the political vacuum. And I think that um, we also have the problem of the vacuum of what's going on in Europe. We'll, we'll just discuss we'll, later. We'll that, Europe yeah. might not be, uh, in a sense, united enough to impose this hard Brexit on us. But it looks like that, that's what they want to do. Uh, I, you know, I think we should be going for the softest okay. possible and you know, least disruptive form of this rupture that we can. But... Carney's response shows it may not be possible. Okay, but, but, but we're, we're running He's talking about protecting time. the City of London and protecting financial services, which is really important, for, not least for sure. the tax take of we're, the country. We are running slightly out of time. Can we do Europe very, very quickly? Mm. Which is that if you look at France, but above all, if you, Italy is all over the papers today, where it looks like next Sunday the Italian Prime Minister might actually lose okay. his yeah. referendum and have to go, and that would possibly bring in the Northern League or the Five Star yeah. Movement, mm -hmm. sort of radicals threaten Italy's membership of the euro and trigger the next crisis. Yeah, it's way bigger than Brexit, this, because if it happens, it means running the Italian banks and a whole sort of right immediate economic implications. I mean, there is, as, uh, as, as Paul's going to tell us here, there is a... <laughs> sorry, I'm stealing your paper. No, no, it's it. I mean, the, the, the <laughs> mail couldn't resist actually. having a nice picture of Virginia Raggi, the mayor of, uh, of Rome, on it. Who's been, been a disaster, apparently. Well, I think she's been excellent. But, uh, <laughs> but and, and it's, interestingly, uh, Raggi is on the left of the Five Star Movement and the interesting thing for this thing it is a proxy vote this thing on the on ne yeah. next weekend f about Europe but it won't lead to any results about Europe unless the government falls but the interesting thing is it the left is you know, the left is going to vote no to to the to the referendum in a way that I think it didn't quite get its act together to do on Brexit you know it, but this is really, really significant because although the referendum in Italy on the 4th of December is actually about something relatively obscure, should the Senate have mm -hmm. fewer powers, what it really means is this could be the next domino falling in European politics, which could, as Fraser quite rightly said, lead to a run on the Italian banks, another huge Eurozone crisis at a moment of political crisis, and uh, it could be really serious. And uh, we've, we've, of course, got Austria with Norbert mm -hmm. Hofer, the, the neo-Nazi, exactly. uh, possibly going to be elected as president, and then there's and France we have to talk France about. So there's a well. whole series of changes. Now, there's a lot we could talk about, but I want to finish off, if we can, with the social care story on the front page of The Observer, because that's a big story. We'll be talking about that in a second. Um, and this is um, a major move by lots and lots of senior people in the NHS and around the NHS to try to persuade the government to think again about social care. Well, councils are in trouble. And I think this is going to be the story that dominates the next nine months. They didn't, the, the, Brexit has, has messed up the public finances. The government didn't give anything to NHS and social care. You've got 59 councils having s seen small care providers hand back the contracts. Now we're hearing this more and more. So y your elderly parent, your elderly grandparent is now being looked after by companies that can't function business-wise. And they're closing down Closing down or handing back the contracts. Fraser, sorry, very briefly, do you think that uh, Philip Hammond made a mistake by not saying much more about this in the autumn statement? 
Well, yes. It, it, what he get, it turns out he's got a huge pot of money we didn't know he had. He wants to spend it on infrastructure. I mean, roads are the new hospitals. That's mm. what we hear there. Um, in doing so, he upset a lot of people who had thought if there was any spare money, they'd quite like some of it. Right. Now, we, it's a good thing to end on because we're going to carry on talking about the NHS. Well, let's start with a look at the Sunday morning papers. I'm joined now by the broadcaster, Eleanor Goodman. Peter Kellner, who used to run the polling company YouGov, but is now set to begin at the charity umbrella group, the NCVO, and the UKIP MEP, Tim Aker. Lots to talk about this morning, as always. Uh, it feels right that we start with Fidel Castro. Um, Eleanor, it's caught your eye this morning. Well, partly because on the way in here, somebody said to me, I don't know what to think about Castro. On the one hand, he, I'm being told he's a hero, and on the other hand, I'm being told he's the greatest villain of all times. And I have to say, the papers, in a way, don't help you very much. Uh, uh, the, um, you get the impression from looking at the sun that maybe they've sided with the people think, saying he's a hero. Our man in heaven, Havana. <laughs> Um, but in fact, what they're trying to do is show that Jeremy Corbyn was completely in love with him. And um, in fact, they, they, what they managed to do, they quote Jeremy Corbyn saying he's a champion. And they mm -hmm. point out that he was wearing a Castro style black cap yesterday when he left home. What they failed <coughs> to point out mm -hmm. is that he also said, uh, he did say in parenthesis, um, something about um, whatever his flaws. So even he did admit there were some flaws. But I, I you can imagine uh, Corbyn having Castro uh, posters all over his bedroom. Well, I, I, I knew Jeremy before he was an MP. We were both members of the Labour Party in uh, Hornsey and Wood Green in North London. And I will say this for him, his views haven't changed. He's been utterly consistent. He holds the same views now as then. And, and the Observer has the quote so, saying that Jeremy Corbyn claimed that for all his flaws, Castro would be remembered as an internationalist and champion of social justice. I think that's rather like saying, for all his flaws, Stalin was an internationalist who defeated <laughs> Hitler. It's an incomplete assessment of the man. And, but more generally, I, I, I haven't read everything in every paper, but I've read a lot. I can't find anybody who says, actually, there were some good things and some bad things. He overthrew a corrupt tyrant in Cuba. Um, infant mortality is lower in Cuba than in the United States, but he was a tyrant who him. locked people up. He didn't have competitive elections. There was no free press. There were political prisoners. Uh, is it impossible for us to say, actually, there are some good things and a lot of bad well, things? In, have 20, both. in 2016, it feels like it's the year of the yeah. political extremes. Everything's black and white. You're on one side or yeah. the other. The centre ground is slightly going out of fashion. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah, that you may quite time. welcome there. Um, but, yeah, it does feel that with... Uh, the, all the press, really, uh, on the death of Castro is very polarised, isn't it? It is, um, and it's um, just what Peter said. Uh, the tribute from Peter Haynes starts with, although responsible for indefensible human rights and free speech abuses, well, you could say that about any tyrant, couldn't you? And I can't, I can't understand how these revisionists some, somehow revere this man. You know, he, he died peacefully, unlike his political opponents. And I think, you know, this is one, one final Cold Warrior gone. I think the only one left is uh, North Korea. And it's time to put communism and its dirty ideology behind us. I, I think uh, Andrew Marr in, in the Sunday Times has an in interesting take on it because he talks about the intervention, invention of Marxism's Mr. Cool. And he points out that there were some very uncool things he, that he did. Um, he uses the word not cool, obviously, in terms of very sarcastically, in the sense that he um, uh, executed between 200 and 17,000 people. Uh, and he went in for what he describes as revolutionary social hygiene, which meant a vicious campaign against gays and degenerates. Definitely not trendy, he says. But what he goes on to claim was that, in a sense, he was a precursor of image politics and that at a time when all the images were of glossy beautiful Kennedys he came up with this image of himself as this heroic bearded figure um, and he's uh, Andy Ma says at the height of the Cold War the US completely outgunned the Soviet bloc when it came to cool imagery but that in his way Castro managed to do it and that he questioned whether or not if it hadn't been for this imagery the one that was plastered over really left-wingers bedroom walls he would have actually succeeded in being seen in this way today I think that slightly overlooks the things he did do in places like South Africa where he sided with um, 
those, the anti-apartheid movement. But it's an interesting take. Mm. Um, but I think the other interesting thing about the, the um, Castro, Castro stuff today is, is the way it's almost totally ignored. Uh, uh, wiped everything else off the front pages, mm. including what you would have expected, all the bre the um, post uh, public spending statement stuff. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. Should we move on and talk about another story? Um, the front of the Sunday Express, uh, Nigel Farage, mm. I fear for my life. Um, seems like quite a stark headline that we've got here with the Sunday Express. Yeah, it's quite a um, well shocking, terrifying uh, headline, which shows what the pressure Nigel Farage has been under. And for 25 years, he's pushed this campaign to get us out of the European Union, got the referendum, won the referendum, and now has to live in fear with 24-hour security. It's quite startling. And it just shows how if you put an opinion that is counter to certain views that certain sections of society have, their response is violence and threats of violence. And I think that's terrible and just shows how low political debate has got in this country. I think that's a fairly extreme reaction, if I may no, say so. No, it's not, Eleanor. You saw the responses to when Trump won and people Joe, tweeting Joe all Cox's sorts of violence about him. On the him. other side of the equation. I, tweeting I, all I, sorts, no, no, no. Tweeting all sorts of violence about him. And it seems that this trendy left, if you disagree with them, their response is threats of violence rather than actual debate and discussion. And you, it's all over social media. It is absurd. Uh, yeah, maybe there are some fruitcakes out there who want a gun for Nigel Farage, and he's probably wise to have security. But to tarnish the left in total... I said some of the left, Peter. Some, some of, the left, of the left. And then some of the right, I could say equally grim things about, and in fact it's a minority. Surely our political discourse can be... can avoid, by implication, tarring a whole range of people. Uh, the people I know on the left would rather not think about Nigel Farage at all, let alone think about killing him. Um, Is this a sad reality for our politics, regardless of what party, party you're from, that mm. actually death threats now become quite a normal part of political discourse? I've been speaking to three female MPs the other day from three different parties. Mm. All of them said that they've received death threats. Is this just the sad reality of where we are now? I think it is. I think it doesn't matter what uh, edge of the spectrum you're on, if you're putting forward a view that is against what the traditional views are, I think you will get some sort of um, backlash to it, which yeah. is a shame because we should be in a, you know, in, a, in a political system. You know, we've got the political system opening up, we've got more parties contesting elections, more parties winning now. There should be the freedom to actually express your views without some sort of backlash. I think what is interesting, actually, I can't, I'm afraid, remember what paper it was in, but there's um, a, th a piece, I think it may have been the Telegraph, saying that the Commission for Racial Equalities is coming up with a report this week urging politicians on all parties to lower the temperature for fear of fostering this kind of extreme behaviour. I have to say, and I'm deeply cynical, and I know this, Tim won't like this, but um, when I saw this, I thought this was, um, you know, uh, rather interesting that it managed to get onto the front page, and one wonders, you know, I, I imagine it's, it's quite important to Farage to be on the front page, but perhaps I'm being overly cynical. I Very. hope in a way I, I'm not. Well, let's ask ourselves this question. Would <coughs> Nigel Farage rather have no death threats and no front page story, or the odd social media death threat and plastered all over the front of the Sunday Express? I mean, Nigel... Well, it wasn't a social media. Credits. He got, a, a, <coughs> last Thursday, um, a potential <coughs> attack. So yeah. it isn't just social yeah. media. This is coming at him. But he is and brilliant, and I say this as a tribute to him, he is brilliant at generating publicity. At the same time though, we can't condemn <coughs> death threats when they are uh, directed towards people in the Labour Party or in the SNP mm. and not condemn them when they're directed at Nigel Farage, can we? Of oh. course, but, but what we are condemning is the odd individual nutter, like that terribly sad, awful man who assassinated Joe Cox. Um, that was an awful event, that was an actual murder, mm. but uh, you know, I wouldn't begin to say some on the right want to kill Labour MPs. That is a preposterous statement. Interesting stuff. Well, let's stay with you, Kip, uh, and have a look at this interview in The Telegraph, uh, which is with Paul Nuttall, uh, and uh, it's done by their assistant political editor, Ben Riley-Smith. It's quite an interesting interview. This is the man, really, who is now being looked at to save mm. UKIP, which I'm mm. sure even you would admit, Tim uh, Aker, isn't, hasn't had the best of months recently, has it? No, but we've gone through worse. We survived Kilroy, so if we survive Kilroy, we can survive anything. A punch up and, the um, <laughs> Well, when, when, you know, where we're active, we're doing well. You know, we've we, we won by elections in Maidstone, Ashford, 
uh, Hartlepool. Uh, where we're active, we're doing well. Where we're not active, we're taking a hit. And we're levelling off at 12, 13%, which is where we were in the general election. And the interesting thing that Paul's laying out is that we're going to march into the Labour heartlands and sweep up the votes. I mean, in my own constituency, we took Tilbury in the May elections, which has always been Labour. You, it's Red Tilbury. And in those areas where we're going to be targeting now, should Paul win, and I certainly hope he does, we will see a Labour Party that is organisationally all over the place. It's not out there on the doors. It's not talking about the issues that working class voters want their politicians to talk about. And it's a wide open goal for you, Kim. Peter Kalner, I'm interested in your mm. thoughts here. Do you think that with Paul Nuttall at the helm, UKIP can start eating into some traditional Labour territory? If the next election isn't until 2020, and it might be earlier, and if UKIP stays together, and there's a, uh, a paragraph in, in, in the story Tim's picked up that, that UKIP might split with Douglas Carswell, their only MP, they're saying here if he thinks he might rejoin the Conservative Party. But if those two things happen, um, then uh, I think there's a real prospect of UKIP taking um, Labour votes. I mean, Labour is, you know, is way out of it. Um, at the moment, and we did see in those Labour heartland areas in the North and Midlands, South Wales, we saw the huge Brexit vote, and that is a sort of canary in the mine, I think, I for the Labour Party. How much it was a Nigel Farage vote, and uh, whether you know another man in a, t a, t a tweed suit who apparently drinks beer is going to have the same impact. I love the fact he's think promising that, that he's yeah, going to keep that's, drinking that's, beer. That's, <laughs> what's wrong with that? Well, you nothing, say it in a sort of derogatory no, way. What's I don't wrong say with that. Just, the occasional He seems plane? to be thinking he has to slip into um, Nigel Farage's position next to the bar, and I would have thought that was one of the you know less less important political strategy issues. And but I think you were what just is talking about you were talking about Castro's identity and the, his public image, and saying that's good, that's good. But Paul Nuttall's talking about his public image, and I'm talking about his public image, and all of a sudden there was a sort no, of, what a I think sort is of you know, cynicism creeping into this story as well. Um, what I think is interesting is that he goes on to say that uh, UKIP obviously has a problem with women and I'd be interested to see how, how, you, how you think you can uh, it's look, it's deal with that deficit. more and more like Donald Trump every day, doesn't it? Well, that's not a, a, a bad man. thing if you're a... If we win like him, then that would be a good thing. Somebody who, was, uh, who, who uh, by his own terms, was abusive towards uh, women, who was a, a billionaire business wheeler and dealer, who wins an election as the representative of the ordinary person who's suffering, well, you know, I'm not saying Paul Nuttall is in quite the same league as Donald Trump, but there are sufficient similarities between the UKIP position and Donald Trump's position uh, that if Labour Party continues to be led by Jeremy Corbyn, um, I have no idea what's going to happen in those in industrial heartlands in 2020. Well, let's try and rattle through a couple more stories, shall we? Uh, Peter Kalner, you have chosen this Times story. Why Brexit means a bigger debt burden for this Britain. This is a man who has porridge mm. for breakfast, yes. I'd like to say. <laughs> stern stuff. Yeah, it's um, very stern stuff. Absolutely. No, this is David Smith, the Sunday Times, excellent um, uh, economics editor. And he's saying, look, public finances are going down the tubes because of Brexit. Now, if it's right, and of course a lot of predictions were made just before the referendum about what happened to the Brexit vote, some of the, a lot of those predictions have not come true. But remember, the core reason, you know, look at the polling data, why Brexit won, was the people voting for Brexit, they wanted control back for Britain, but they didn't think there were any economic downsides to it. They thought it was a cost-free option. Well, if it becomes clear in the next year or two that it's a, a decision with real costs in terms of living standards, in terms of, of, of jobs, in terms of investment in Britain, then we're into a wholly new ball game. So I think the political consequences you know, re remember those promise to spend an extra £350 million a week on the health service. Well, if the public finances won't allow it, well, that's letting down a lot of people who voted for Brexit. Well, after it's potentially it's depressing viewers slightly with that story, I think we should end on a slightly mm. more upbeat note, well, which I, is Ed I, Ball's I, I, I was saying to, in, in the green room mm. before, you know, when you read this stuff about the, the outlook mm. for the economy as David Smith sees it, and you think, well, why is Labour not going to win the next election? Mm. Whatever, whatever you feel about Labour. And the answer is you can't imagine that happening under Jeremy Corbyn. And that's where I think this great story about Ed Balls. This is the uh, Sunday Express. In though. the Sunday Express about his performance in, in the Strictly. Um, you know, I think what, if they had any sense, the Labour Party, the next time a by-election comes up, they, some of the party would select Ed Balls 
um, who has become a sort of popular hero, um, and um, then he could dance his way to the Labour leadership. Yeah, but are they <laughs> voting for him to keep him in or to watch him suffer? No, I think, they're, they're, I think he's shown himself to be a human being, and one of the great problems with politicians, and possibly one of Nigel Farage's strengths, is that he has been seen as a human being, and suddenly Ed Balls, instead of being the man who invented androgynous growth uh, theory, is the man struggling with his <laughs> fleckles or <laughs> freckles or whatever but, but, it is. But, but, but remember what happened to George Galloway, who many people... George Galloway no, no, wait, was wait, 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 wait. quite different. But, uh, didn't have blue eyes. But all the attacks on him being far left had no effect. But he went on Big Brother, imitated a cat, and he became a ridiculous figure. Okay. And that was just one moment of one yeah. program. I think you got I, it wrong. This Ed is... Balls, I think, will, will, will suffer the same if you try to come back into frontline we'll politics. To, um, we'll have to uh, potentially leave it there. Um, if that was the easiest way to win political office, to learn the quick tango, I think he may have nailed that formula. <laughs> So this week in politics saw the death of communist titan Fidel Castro, the death of the autumn statement to be replaced by the autumn budget and a toughening up on executive pay. Well, let's go over some of that news with our top team of pundits. We've got Kevin Schofield, the editor of Politics Home, Aisha Hazarika, the former Labour advisor and Sebastian Payne, political leader writer for the Financial Times. Let's start with Theresa May's interview in uh, the Sunday Times, shall we? Because we always jump on any bit of insight that we get into her personality, because really she's been such a closed book for so long. Did we, did we learn anything new, do you think, Kevin? I think it's interesting that her advisers are obviously telling her to sort of open up a little bit more, soften that, that image. You know, they've, they've been very, since she's been in number 10, they've really kept a tight lid on anything, really. You know, everything, announcements are all kept very, very closely guarded. Ministers are told to be on their best behaviour, don't say anything that's going to uh, reflect badly on the government. So this is quite interesting, I think. I think it just shows a more, a more, human, more human side to her and how her life has, has changed since she's become Prime Minister. She talks about how she came out of a shop the, the other day and a woman came up to her and said, my friends are getting married at the weekend. Can, you, um, can, I, can I have a quick selfie with you? And she had to say a message, happy wedding day, hope you have a great time. <laughs> Which, you, you know, she's probably been deeply <laughs> uncomfortable doing that, but she just realises that's, that's what comes with, with the job it, these days, it? yeah. I was also fascinated to, to hear that Philip May helps her choose the clothes. What an insight. Yeah. <laughs> there, was a, there was some nice colour, actually, about her relationship with um, Philip. Uh, she sort of said that, you know, obviously they're a very, very close unit and uh, there's quite funny things about how he's now having to get used to people writing about what clothes he wears and people having selfies with him but there was also a nice bit of detail I think about her um, role as a, as a female MP as well and of course she's the only like second woman to get into Downing Street talking about the work she did with Anne Jenkin in terms of women to, to, to win in the Conservative Party but saying that they had to sort of do it in a kind of quite restrained way in the Labour Party they're more kind of out about um, you know trying to get more women into politics they sort of seem to do it a bit more under the radar but it's good to hear her talking about being a woman in politics and it made me think of the memo that went around Whitehall this week saying don't mansplain <laughs> to the Prime Minister and I thought yeah. it proves you've got a long way to go when you've got the top job in government and politics and you're still having blokes mansplaining yeah. to this you. This was a great story by uh, Sam Coates this week wasn't it from the Times yeah. Yeah, saying that there were civil servants who've been ticked off for speaking over the Prime Minister. I would not want to be in that position <laughs> having to try and do that. One of the most interesting things I found in this which I've heard from other people in the cabinet, the first move she made when she moved into Downing Street was to get rid of the Cameron sofa and bring in the May table. And this tells you everything you really need to know about her style of governing. That instead of, you know, when you went in to see David Cameron, it would be a let her sit on the sofa and a cosy chat and, you know, maybe a cup of tea or have a trees and may you go in and it's a big glass table and you sit at the table and you're doing business at the table and I think that really shows you how she manages the government differently much more formal much more about process doing through things through cabinet committees and less casual talk and I think Aisha's point on Philip May is very key here that um, the Prime Minister's spouse is a very interesting role because we don't have a first lady or first gentleman role in this country but Philip May is a very influential figure every major decision Theresa May makes goes through her husband because don't forget they met at the Oxford University Conservative Association he's a very political person as well and I think we see some of that interview that he's very much her bastion and top advisor. Yeah it was interesting I spoke to Dave I mean Green a bit earlier on the programme who of course went to university with no both friend, Theresa yeah. and Philip May mm. so knew them both and he seemed to be saying that at the time it wasn't really clear which of them would go on to be the political superstar Philip or Theresa. 
that's often the way with political couples. I mean, Tony and Cherie, Blair famously, she at one point was tipped to be the one that would, would go into to politics. But I suppose um, the one cautionary note I would say is that w she is the Prime Minister. She has worked very, very hard to get where she is. I don't think we should have a situation where she's the woman, but everyone's going, well, she is a woman there, but actually all the decisions, don't worry, all the decisions yeah. are going to go through Philip. Or Tim Nick Timothy. Or Nick Timothy, exactly. Been described, this is her advisor, of course, who's been described as her brain, which is, in a way, is a little bit... bit insulting, yes. Yeah. 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 insulting, yeah, exactly. It's insulting to her other um, Joint Chief of Staff, Fiona Hill, as well, who is just as influential, just as important, the Prime Minister's thinking, and yet the media now to the focus is always on Nick Timothy's role, and the fact is... They're both very important, and Theresa May has a brain herself. She can make these decisions without her husband and without her advisers, and so far she seems to be pretty good at it. Well, you, you don't survive six years as Home Secretary unless you're very, very good, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, and she's brought that same sort of mindset, I think, into into the Ten Downing Street. You know, as you say, very formal, very very process driven, and. Um, well, and she also says in the interview that she's having many, many sleepless nights over Brexit, which I can well understand. She's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like the impossible task, isn't it, of keeping everyone happy uh, when it comes uh, to Brexit. How do you think she's doing on, on that? Well, I think she's on a sticky wicket because I think Brexit is a huge problem. Clearly, there was no discernible plan for Brexit. Now, you could argue that's because... Okay it's a, a leap into the dark with a blindfold on <laughs> in terms of how this stuff pans out. But I think it is difficult for her. I think she has got to, you know, this, we're not giving a running commentary, I don't think is a satisfactory line. As an ex-spinner myself, you say you're not going to give a running commentary when you basically don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> and I think nobody's expecting sort of forensic, everything laid out, but I think she's got to give people a bit more comfort and a bit more transparency. Because all that happens then is we overinterpret and leap on the least little thing. Like last week at the CBI, she said that she doesn't want a cliff edge. So straight away, that set of hair running over, we won't be out of the EU within two years, will there be a, a transitional arrangement whereby we'll still be there maybe 2021. And then number 10 had to very quickly damp that down. No, we're leaving after two years. There's no question of us extending our membership. And this all comes from the fact that we're not really getting any hard and fast information, so we end up having to speculate. I think the key point they're going to lose control of this is when Article 50 is triggered, because at that point, everyone else is going to be spinning. So you're going to have Michel Barnier's team, you're going to have all the European leaders, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and they will fill that void. They will be beginning to leak and tell you how it's all going at that point. Downing Street needs to have a media strategy so they can say to the British press, well, this is the Prime Minister's position, our position. If they hold that line of we're not giving a running commentary, yeah. then the running commentary will come from Europe and they will lose control of the story very, very quickly. So I mean, hope they're prepared for that. <laughs> oh, I think we all hope that. <laughs> yeah. let's, um, let's talk about the other uh, big news uh, of the weekend, which of course is the death of Fidel Castro. Lots of different uh, perspectives coming through in the newspapers. It feels as though uh, it's all black and white. You either think he's the best thing for since sliced bread or a complete and utter tyrant. Uh, where, do you, where do we stand here? Um, I would probably go on the complete and utter tyrant point. I think it's absolutely disgraceful what we've seen from some politicians such as Ken Livingstone, Peter Hayden, and of course Jeremy Corbyn, who is the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, who said that talked about problems of excess and for all his flaws. This kind of language is just not acceptable from someone who wants to be Prime Minister of this country. Amnesty International, who has not been allowed into Cuba since 1990, talks about the um, the critics experiencing harassment, the politically motivated prosecutions. In the last year alone, there's 8,600 politically motivated detentions in Cuba. On record, there's 3,600 deaths by firing squad, 1,200 deaths by extrajudicial killings. This is a country that we're talking about a revolutionary hero here. It's absolute junk and we should be intolerant of it. And people talk about Cuba's economy as well. There was little economic growth in 55 Five years of his reign. In 1959, the GDP per capita was $2,067. By 1999, it was 2300 That's a stagnant economy, and I just think we should be very clear on what this was. Castro was a brutal dictator. He was rightly shunned by the civilised world. And I think people in the mainstream of British politics and elsewhere, Justin Trudeau as well, who have been apologists for this man, should be absolutely condemned by this, and I think it's just unacceptable.
Tell us what you really think. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a bit, like, a bit unclear there. Um, well, I, I agree with a, a lot of what Sebastian said. I think from the left's point of view, there is a lot of romanticism going on about how they're viewing um, Castro. And I think that's partly because I think that the left feel that they have a very strong muscular argument which is quite revolutionary the left feels like it wants to be revolutionary so i think that's why they are choosing to sort of skirt mm. over all the bad things you've heard a lot today from senior figures um in the from the left saying you know i know some bad things happened but it's the but it's yeah, the but yeah, you know the the, 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 yeah. the the left is very much like let's just like focus on the the but thing but i think you you can't for all the interesting history, for the fact that this was a very, you know, charismatic, interesting, heroic figure, film-like figure, these terrible things happened. These absolute abhorrent abuses of human rights were happening for, for, for decades. And there, you can't do a but on that. We weren't saying that about Pinochet. Kevin. And I think you have to be equal, fair. Where's well, yeah. One? Well, I mean, the, the Jeremy Corbyn statement that he put out yesterday was a kind of classic of, of the genre, really. I mean, he rightly says he's a, a, a giant of the 20th century. There's no arguing with that, whether you think he's a great guy or not. But it was the for all his flaws comment. I mean, just sort of dismissing um, the fact that, he, I mean, he banned trade unions, which you would think, mm. if you're a Labour Party leader, you might frown on someone who wanted to ban trade unions before you get to all the extrajudicial executions and the locking up of gay people, yeah. people with HIV who were HIV positive yeah. in the 1990s, they were locked up as well. All that is just swept away as flaws. Um, so that you can sort of talk about, uh, they always fall back on his, the great health service in Cuba and the great education system, which I think is overstated as well, quite frankly. So, I mean, there's an awful lot of humbug, basically, over the last 24 hours. Aisha, now we've uh, got you here, I'm quite keen to ask your thoughts on Theresa May's announced crackdown on executive pay. Some people are suggesting this is rather rem reminiscent <laughs> of Ed Miliband circa 2015. As, well, as, as one of his advisors, what, what, what's your take? As somebody who helped write that tortured uh, predators versus producers <laughs> <laughs> speech, it does feel like deja vu. It feels like there's lots of policies that um, Theresa has been quite magpie-like um, from, from the Ed Miliband, um, or, you know, whether it's the, the letting agents, um, this executive pay. But look, the devil is going to be in the detail. And these are still quite small policy things. I think it's very interesting that she has moved away from having workers on boards, which actually would have been something quite significant. That would have been quite a radical shake-up of corporate governance in this country. But yeah, I think Ed Miliband, actually, he's, he's, he's got quite sassy in his tweet game now, <laughs> and he's kind of calling her out on all the policies that she's, she's stealing. But look, the rhetoric is one thing. You've got to look at the reality of actually what happens and how much of how strongly these policies are, are implemented. Yeah, he's certainly upped his tweet game uh, since the 2015 <laughs> general election. I'm not sure he's had some kind of personality transplant or something. Um, Sebastian, um, I'm interested what your views are on from the Financial Times mm. sort of perspective on this. Do you think that these kind of policies could be off-putting to businesses, or do you think that actually it's all about giving people more faith in the capitalist system? So I think there's obviously a bit of both here. Um, I think this government actually went a bit too far in the wrong direction and when Theresa May gave that speech at Conservative Party conference where she lambasted citizens of the world which dare I say to our Financial Times readers <laughs> um, it was felt in the city hang on a minute what's going on here and I think they almost forgot a bit that they were Prime Minister because Theresa May has given a lot of tub thumping speeches at the Tory conference for years and then only picked up you know by the Daily Mail the Daily Telegraph and they do well the fact was that speech was watched by every capital city in the world and from Germany to Tokyo they looked at this and thought what kind of prime minister is this? Like London's meant to be a city of finance and there has been a recalibration. So her Mansion House speech, her CBI speech, we've got this executive pay stuff and we've got the industrial strategy. I think that's a certain way to say, okay, we do want to work with business, we do want to be friendly. And that's an approach that we've welcomed in our, uh, in our leader column. And I think we do, you know, we acknowledge that business isn't very well liked and there does need to be reforms of the kind that Aisha was talking about. But at the same time, um, you know, we, we, given Brexit, we can't just close up to business entirely. And we need to get that balance right. On the workers on board things, one quick point I want to make there. Theresa always said representatives of workers on boards, and her language could imply workers on board, but she never actually said workers on boards here. So it could be a certain director who's responsible for that. So it was seen as a U-turn, not quite sure it was a U-turn. 
Okay, well, great as always uh, to discuss the, the week with the three of you. Thanks very much for coming on. <coughs> now, political readers around the world have been reacting to the news of the death of Fidel Castro, a Cuban revolutionary who came to power in 1959 and ushered in a Marxist revolution. Uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson described the former leader as an historic, if controversial, figure, said his death marked the end of an era. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said Castro was a champion of social justice, who had seen off a lot of US presidents during his decades in power. President-elect Donald Trump described the former Cuban leader as a brutal dictator, adding that if he hoped his death would begin a new era in which the wonderful Cuban people finally live in the freedom they so richly deserve. Meanwhile, the president of the European Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, said the controversial leader was a hero for many, but his legacy will be judged by history. Well, I guess we'd work that out ourselves, that his legacy would be judged by history. What do you make of the reactions so far across the political divide? Um, predictable. And I noticed that um, Jeremy Corbyn has come under a lot of criticism uh, for his tribute, in effect, mm -hmm. to uh, Castro. But I think it was uh, the right thing for him to do. We all know he was an admirer. He could have sat there for eight hours in his house agonising over some bland statement which didn't alienate the many people who want to wade in to attack Castro. It would have been wholly inauthentic. It would have just added to the sort of mainstream consensus. And I think he was right to say what he believed in this particular respect. Um, elsewhere, it's wholly predictable um, that there would be this divide because he divided opinion in such an emotive way. I mean, don't you think, Steve, I take your point about authenticity and it yeah. might have looked a bit lame for uh, Jeremy Corbyn to pretend that he had no affection uh, for Fidel Castro at all. But don't you think he made a bit of an error dismissing Castro's record as, you know, the negative side of it is just a flaw. You know, he could have perhaps acknowledged in rather more elaborate terms the huge costs that uh, you know, he wanted to go on about the health and education, which actually, if you look up the indices on that, they are quite good relative to yeah. other countries, but they've come at such a huge cost. And, you know, champion of justice, certainly not champion of criminal justice. I think if he had done that, it would have been utterly inauthentic. He doesn't believe he, it. He doesn't believe it. And you have to, and he would have thought also there would be many other people focusing on all the uh, epic failings. Um, and so he focused on what he genuinely believed. And I think there are times when Corbyn's prominence in the sort of media world now, he's leader, um, widens the debate in quite an interesting an important way. And this is an example. I mean, I'm not aware of any criticisms, Mr. Corbyn, has ever uh, announced about uh, Mr. Castro? Well, there was uh, four words in his statement yesterday, uh, which you could see some spin doctor forcing him to say. <laughs> Actually, three, <laughs> for all his flaws, comma. Mm. That was it. So I'm But I'm not aware that he's ever, I mean, look, I may be wrong. People will no, no doubt put it right. I'm not aware that, because he was on this Cuban Solidarity Committee, mm -hmm. yeah. which didn't exist to criticize Castro. <coughs> it existed to help protect Castro from those, particularly the Americans, who were trying to undermine him. Uh, and Corbyn made a big deal yesterday saying he's always called out human rights abuses everywhere in the world. I, I like you, am unaware he's ever called out Castro for his human rights abuses. But he generalized that. He, he said that in general, mm. I call out human rights abuses. Exactly. He never said, I have called out human rights abuses exactly. in uh, uh, Cuba. Uh, uh, what we will get in the weeks ahead is a lot more will come out about what these human rights abuses mm. will be. The lid will come mm. off what, what was actually happening. And some stories, um, well-authenticated stories, are pretty horrendous. Yeah, and uh, I was speaking to a American <coughs> journalist who was working there in the 1990s um, who uh, gave me some very vivid examples of that and there will be much more to come. I still go back to when a major figure dies and you are a leader who has admired that major figure, you have to say it. And, but and there the, is a call. That's the elephant for, trap he's just fallen into. He, yes, he's, just, he's just absolutely stood up every single <coughs> criticism from the centre left to the uh, medium hard left that he is uh, uh, stuck in the wall uh, 
old but, ideologue but he's not, who belongs uh, uh, to the 1970s. But he's not alone in, be, in being quite effusive in his praise. The Canadian Prime Minister, Mr Trudeau, was uh, pretty effusive. The Irish President was so effusive, I wondered whether they were going to open a book of condolences, as De Valera <laughs> did for Hitler in yeah, 1945. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, I just think it reinforces Corbyn's failing brand. That's a problem. It may be authentic, but authentic isn't working for him. But it's quite interesting. When I was uh, driving in, I heard uh, uh, Trevor Phillips, <coughs> who's, uh, well, how would you categorise him, a Blairite or something, mm. saying the record is mixed, there were quite a lot of things to admire, as well as all the terrible things. And so it's quite nuanced. However, if you are a leader issuing a soundbite, as we all know, there's no space for nuance. You either decide to go for the consensus, that is to say, on the whole, you, it was a brutal dictatorship, or you say, um, here is an extraordinary figure uh, worthy of admiration. And he was right, in my view, to say what he believed, and he did. And there's, uh, there still is a, a final dilemma left for the British government, we must remember. Who are we going to send to the funeral? Mm -hmm. So do we send nobody at all? Do we send Boris Johnson, well, which some may somebody. say might be a sort of post-ironic statement in itself? Uh, <laughs> we certainly have to send Theresa somebody May. because there is we, now a post-Castro Cuba to deal with. But it yeah. could be the American yeah. am our ambassador to America, Kim Dagg. Okay. That would be an interesting move. Trump was quite diplomatic about post-Castro Cuba. Yeah. And Boris Johnson's statement was restrained. Well, so we shall see. I mean, the thing about Mr Castro was the longevity. 50 years of and keeping Marxism in the, that one island, that's what made it so fascinating.